So we're live streaming the webinar. So I'm very pleased to have, uh, let me just switch us to gallery view. So we get both of us, great. So I'm, I'm really happy to be able to introduce Robert Forte. Robert Forte um, is an author and a scholar. He is a, um, I sort of feel like you're a rogue historian, perhaps. He's willing to go where no man else would dare to go when it comes to researching um, the um, dark underbelly of psychedelic culture. And so he is here to give us an unflinching view of the people's history of psilocybin. Thank you for being here, Robert. Well, you're welcome, Daniel. Thank you for inviting me. I wanted to say just a couple things about uh, this format, which I'm just getting used to. You know, I mean, I, I've been giving um, more public talks lately, but there's something a little, um, I'm a little uncomfortable about this method here because usually when I talk, I can, I can see the audience and I can kind of play off of their movements, their, their facial expressions. I know who's there. I can vibe with them. But here I'm talking to a group. I really don't know who's there, how many people, what's on their mind. And in a way, this is a kind of um, sort of a violation, maybe that's a strong word about a policy that I have concerning psychedelic drugs, because after so many years of studying this subject with a great deal of thoroughness on a lot of levels, it's occurred to me that really we ought to best regard these as a secret teaching, a mystery school. And um, if you look throughout history, this is really, um, this is really the best model. Now, mystery comes from words which mean to shut your senses and to be silent about. And that means that, um, or another, another example of a secret teaching are the Upanishads, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Now, Upanishad in Sanskrit means to sit near. These were secret teachings. What, what was right for one person at one time was not right for the same person at another time. Like secret teachings, mystery schools are not democratic. That, um, and yet, you know, here we are in this period, this psychedelic renaissance where it's absolutely mind blowing to me to see this incredible proliferation of information and um, endorsement, even hyping about psychedelic drug. This is unprecedented in ancient history. The, the ancient Eleusinian mysteries, which were a psychedelic drug cult, as you know, were, um, were so secret and so uh, the secret was so respected that you weren't allowed to talk about what went on during your initiation at Eleusis. This was a mystery cult that went on for, we're not sure how long, 1500 years, maybe 2000 years that, the, that anybody who was uh, a citizen of ancient Greece could participate, had to participate in these psychedelic initiations, but they weren't allowed to talk about what happened outside the sanctuary. And nobody did, very few people did for, for the 2000 years of these, these mysteries. And yet here we are in the modern world where, I mean, it's hard to pick up a newspaper or listen to a, listen to a radio show without somebody throughout the political spectrum, endorsing psychedelic drugs. You've seen this press as much as I have. I mean, psychedelic drugs, if you, if you look at the mainstream media, they might make you a billionaire like Steve Jobs. They will cure your depression. They will, they will cure your post-traumatic stress disorder if you've become too freaked out about the wars. Nothing in the press about how they might undermine wars, but we might return to that. Psychedelic drugs are being typed and, and hyped for almost everything. And I find this really remarkable and unprecedented in history. <clears throat> and so one of the reasons that I've agreed to kind of take these risks is to offer another point of view about these substances. And, um, you know, I've named this talk, um, The People's History, shamelessly, stealing from Howard Zinn's brilliant books, of course, The People's History of the United States, because um, 
you know, Zinn used that title because he wanted to write a history. History, has, as we all know, is written by the victors. And Zinn wanted to write a book about American history from the standpoint, not of the establishment, but of the people. And so it's the same with psychedelic history. We're seeing now this incredible wave of media where everybody is hyping psychedelic drugs. Why are they hyping psychedelic drugs? Is it because of their, they've got some sort of personal or financial um, advantage for doing this? What, there's all this, um, so I'm offering a, a point of view where I'm not selling anything. Um, I just wanna give a, tell a story that's somewhat contrary to the prevailing narrative of psychedelic drugs. And I wanna emphasize that this point of view that I have comes from many, many years now. I, I, I'm, I can't really believe it, but it's really been almost 40 years that I've been a very keen student of this subject starting in my early 20s. And um, Daniel, you said a moment ago that I'm a rogue historian, that I will say things that where no other historian has gone. And so I wanna just, um, before I really get started here, I wanna just um, show a little bit of my bibliography in no apparent order, because I'd like to, um, I'd really like to engage an audience. What I'm going to present are not conclusions but it's a conversation that I and a growing number of scholars and psychedelic enthusiasts are starting to take. So, so really I've just grabbed some books off my shelf and in, and in no particular order, for those of you who are scholarly inclined, um, these are books, some of them will be disturbing, they'll be challenging, but they're very, very important in order to have a, a thorough history of the psychedelic drugs. And there's one other thing I want to say, based on what you said a moment ago, Daniel, about my, um, you know, like pouring into the, the dark side, the underbelly of psychedelic drugs. I want to emphasize right at the start that um, I love these psychedelic drugs. I have tremendous respect for their power. I have uh, been involved in this subject in very many ways as a manufacturer of MDMA, having been taught directly by Sasha Shogun, my friends and I. I've worked closely with Timothy Leary, Albert Hoffman, Gordon Wasson. Frank Barron was my mentor for 20 years, a not well-known uh, person in the psychedelic movement, but Frank is the man who turned on Timothy Leary and in many ways started this. I've worked for decades as a guide, guiding people into mystical experiences with psychedelic drugs. I have tremendous respect and in many ways, I'm devoted to the healing power of these drugs. I'm, I'm raising these issues because I feel it is absolutely necessity, an absolute necessity that people who are mm, lured into this subject by this wave of enthusiasm might be missing out on something that is extremely important and may save them a lot of confusion. I'm not alone in my point of view. And here I'm just gonna bring, rattle off some stuff before we really get into my story. Like here's, here's a very important book by, um, by a, an important anthropologist um, on Carlos Castaneda, J. Courtney Fix, Fikes. Now, you know, in my generation, I'm 60 years old, we were subject to a wave of these books by Carlos Castaneda who had, um, allegedly written his PhD thesis uh, at UCLA anthropology department about his meetings with a Yaqui Indian shaman or sorcerer uh, named Don Juan. These books sold millions of copies. They introduced millions of people to this, you know, hitherto not well-known world of shamanism and the taking of plants and drugs and mystical experiences. And J. Courtney Fikes, um, who is an anthropologist and was close with the Huicholi Indians, is one of two or three scholars who have penetrated the Castaneda myth and shown how he was in cahoots with intelligence agencies. And the whole story is a complete farce. It's a hoax. There is no Don Juan. Carlos Castaneda did not go wandering around the desert and in correspondence with this Don Juan sorcerer. He made it up completely while plagiarizing the work of other anthropologists 
in the UCLA library. So this is one book that I would urge you to read to get another point of view. I'm just going through these now. <clears throat> um, this is a very important book by a, by a man who was a very important friend and teacher of mine, uh, Ralph Metzner, who passed away a few months ago. All of Ralph's writings are, are um, required reading to have a full understanding of the history and phenomenology of psychedelic drugs. But I mentioned this one, I'm pulling this one out because it's one of the later books of Ralph Metzner, who um, I loved Ralph. He was a teacher and a guide for many, many years. And he is one of the very few um, prominent people in the psychedelic movement, uh, as, as, as well as myself, who really understands how completely mind controlled modern society is. And we're gonna to return to that later, but Ralph, God bless his soul with the courage to come out in here and talk about 9-11, the 9-11 conspiracy and how the American modern world has been fooled by this hoax. That's one book, Ralph Metzner. Um, while we're on that subject, I wanna point out this book by my also friend and colleague, the German scholar, Matthias Breukers, who is, um, he and I are currently writing a book together that is a response to Michael Pollan. This is one of the first best-selling books on the 9-11 mind control conspiracy written in Europe. Matthias is a prolific author, was a very, very close friend for many, many years of Albert Hoffman, many, many conversations about this, you know, like hidden history. Of, uh, of psychedelics and mind control. So that's another one. Um, this is a very, very important book on the CIA and mind control by John Marks, who used to work for the State Department. And some very, very important data was originally released in this book, which I'm gonna return to about Gordon Wasson, the man who really kicked off the psychedelic movement, someone who I had personal connection with. And I'm gonna return to that too, but just to, kind of respond to Daniel about me being the only one. <clears throat> this book, A Terrible Mistake by investigative journalist, reporter, and attorney, also recently deceased, Hank Alberelli, a book called A Terrible Mistake. Stan Groff, who was a very, very important teacher of mine, one of my first teachers, called me a few years ago and said, have you seen this book by Hank Alberelli? And I said, no, I haven't. He said, well, would you read it and tell me if it's true? Because in here, Alberelli makes a rather audacious claim that Dr. Albert Hoffman, a man who we, needs no introduction, who treated me like his grandson for many years, the chemist at Sandoz who discovered psilocybin and LSD was involved in a nefarious way with what's called the incident at Pont Saint Esprit, which was an event in 1951 when an entire village in France was dosed with some sort of psychedelic drug, some kind of some kind of ergot or LSD derivative, and it sent the whole town into madness. Many people died. Later, it was found out that it was a CIA operation, an experiment in their MK Ultra program. And it's, um, it's a real eye-opening book. It's about six or 700 pages and about um, 300 of them are footnotes. So this is an essential book to read um, about the hidden history of psychedelic drugs. Also on this category, is a very excellent book by my colleague and friend, David Black, an English scholar and writer, LSD, The Secret History of LSD, which raises some very disturbing, but again, essential understandings about who was behind the large scale underground propagation of LSD in the United States, getting into some very disturbing revelations about the brotherhood of eternal love, uh, a lot of information here about a very shady character named Ronald Stark, who was one of the largest LSD uh, propagators in the world in the uh, 1960s. Uh, David has a uh, kind of a sequel to this book that's out now and available. If you're in the UK, you can get a Kindle. Going through these quickly for my scholarly minded friends. This is an essential book by the uh, professor of journalism 
at um, Miami University in Hawaii by Stephen Siff. This book is especially relevant today once we look at, when we want to look critically and carefully at the, at the propagation of psychedelic drugs in our media. This is a book, Acid Hype, Psychedelic Experience and the American News Media. It's based on his dissertation. And it's a confirmation of something that, I forget if it was Abby Hoffman or Timothy Leary used to say that the person mostly responsible for popularizing psychedelic drugs in America was not Timothy Leary, but it was actually Henry Luce. And people that really wanna get into this are gonna to have to be students of modern American history. I'm gonna get into some of this stuff, but you need to understand who Henry Luce was and what role his media enterprise played in the post-war US Ameri United States of America. I just got a couple more here. This is a very, very important book called Who Paid the Piper? by the journalist Francis Stoner, which is a kind of funny, Saunders, I'm sorry, Francis Stoner Saunders, about a little known operation of the Central Intelligence Agency, which is called the Congress for Cultural Freedom. So beginning in the 19, early 1950s, um, the CIA started a public relations campaign. So they secretly funded a great many kind of uh, eccentric avant-garde art movements, literary movements in the United States and in Europe to give the impression that America was a diverse, progressive, forward thinking, the absolute opposite of a fascist country. It was um, the here in the United, like the modern art movement was very much begun and funded by the CIA to give this impression of a wild and interesting time in America. The psychedelic movement, was also wrapped up in this operation called the Congress for Cultural Freedom. <clears throat> I could do this whole talk just on books, but I'm gonna just get through this. This summit is sponsored in part by the Congress of Cultural Freedom. <laughs> You're right, Daniel. I can't wait to sit down and smoke a joint with you. This is a very, very interesting book for our literary historians, which is called St. Peter's Snow. This book was brought to my attention by my friend and one of the really important scholars like me, who's kind of deconstructing the psychedelic myths. This is St. Peter's Snow, a rare copy. And it's a book that was written in the 1920s about a group of German scientists who were searching through ergot for the ingredient in ergot that would cause a mystical experience. This is a novel about these scientists who find this ingredient in ergot and then you isolate it and then use it to start a faux religious movement that would become sort of a cul-de-sac for people and get people interested in mystical experience in a way that would distract them from the political developments of the time. The book follows, the novel follows almost the exact sequence of the discovery of LSD that did not happen for another 10 or 12 years. So um, this book is essential and it's essential reading along with Alan Piper's, I don't have these copies here, recent monographs, Strange Bedfellows on the role of, the, of far right ideologues in the propag including Albert Hoffman, in the propagation of the psychedelic movement. So remember that name, Alan Piper. Um, okay, here's a book, The Devil's Chessboard about post-war America, about the creation of the CIA and the morphing of the Third Reich into the American national security state about the Dulles brothers who started the MKUltra program. Thorough, dense, well-researched critical reading for the student of modern American history. Here's another one. In case anybody wants to say I'm alone working in this field, they, they need to catch up a little bit. This is a book by John Potash called Drugs as Weapons Against Us. This is a really brilliant and important book, although I, I criticize it because he fails to acknowledge in this book that psychedelic drugs also have healing and valuable religious properties. 
but it's an important book because it shows the history of drugs and how drugs are used by oligarchs, by political structures to suppress the masses. It's in a way the, the um, It's the most concise history of this problem, getting into the Skull and Bones uh, fraternity in, um, at Yale University where the, LSD, where the CIA came from and where the psychedelic movement came from. Critical reading. I'm almost done here. This is a book by a man who had become a, first a nemesis to me and then a dear friend and a, just a most beloved rascal Timothy Leary, and a, a really, um, you know, his later writings were kind of as scattered as he had become. But this book, The Intelligence Agents, contains a chapter on the scene at Berkeley where he did his PhD and the infiltration of government CIA, where he first admits his um, attempted recruitment by the CIA. So Timothy Leary, The Intelligence Agents. Um, I pulled this one off my shelf just because um, it's dramatic and it's an important book. They thought we were, we thought, they thought they were free. It's a memoir of Nazi Germany. Now we can all agree that the Nazi, that the German society was a heavily mind controlled society induced by sophisticated propaganda made to fear and their fear turned into violence. And this is, uh, this is a great book with many parallels, I think, to where we are today. Um, I pulled this one off my shelf because this is another book by one of my most beloved teachers and friends, Professor Houston Smith, I think probably the most um, authoritative religious minded scholar and historian to really address the topic of psychedelic drugs. And I see my work uh, very much inspired by Houston. I spent a lot of time with him. Uh, it was like going to visit Lao Tzu. And I'm raising this book because although Houston is a, is a great enthusiast of the power of psychedelic drugs in the context of inducing mystical experience, he is also extremely cautionary. And one of the great lines in this book, one that I repeat a lot, is that um, yes, psychedelic drugs can cause a religious experience, but they abort the religious life, that they upset the normal developmental cycle of um, spiritual progress. And so tread carefully, brilliant and important book. Houston was um, invited to do this book and then declined to do it because he was, um, didn't want to be known as a drug scholar, but I, I actually was the one who persuaded him to accept the invitation and to do this book. So um, add it to your library. And then um, this is not self-promotion, but um, this is one of the most important books in the history of psychedelic drugs called The Road to Eleusis. It was originally written by Gordon Wasson and Albert Hoffman about the ancient Greek use of LSD-like substances or psilocybin. Um, and I did it um, for practical and legal reasons to offer another model for how to advance the psychedelic phenomena in the mystery school model. That we'd, all, we'd already realized that psychedelics were used in indigenous cultures, but wasn't so well known that they were also at the very root of American Western philosophy and religion. And so um, this is, uh, begins that conversation, extremely important book. I brought it back into print in 1998 and then this third edition in uh, which Houston and I wrote the preface and introduction is available through North Atlantic Books. Finally, I like to um, point this book out, which is the first book that I did. Um, started out as uh, my master's paper under um, Professor Mircea Iliade at the Divinity School of the University of Chicago. Um, it became, um, was gonna be a series of journal articles for the Albert Hoffman Foundation, which I was a director of. And then it became a fundraiser for the Council on Spiritual Practices, which is behind this important research at Johns Hopkins, Houston Smith, says this is the best single inquiry into the religious significance of psychedelic drugs. And um, that was very flattering. So 
Now, uh, here we are in the midst of this Renaissance. Now, in spite of these critical comments that I'm making, uh, insinuating mind control and CIA operations, which are true. Like I said, I also have a great respect for the power of these drugs. And I was drawn into the subject 40 years ago because it, it seemed to me then that our culture was at a real breaking point, a crisis point, and that we needed a spiritual awakening, some kind of religious revival to help us help our culture see more clearly the military the environmental crisis, the psychological crisis. And, um, and these psychedelic drugs can have these remarkable properties. And if they were used correctly, if we could learn from the mistakes of the 60s, we could maybe give them another chance and help try to liberate us from, from the fate that seemed inevitable. This is a Rumi poem that I begin this book with that you know just I think captures where I'm coming from. This is Rumi. This is how a human being can change. There's a worm addicted to eating grape leaves. Suddenly, he wakes up. Call it grace, whatever. Something wakes him, and he's no longer a worm. He's the entire vineyard and the orchard, too. The fruit, the trunks, a growing wisdom and joy that doesn't need to devour. So like here we are in this country, this culture of rapacious capitalism. Max Weber, of course, the great sociologist and scholar of capitalism, kind of nailed this back in the 1800s, identifying the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, kind of summing it up in the Protestant Reformation, that we had this, we were induced with this idea that, you know, that God was up there in the sky, in the clouds, and here we were, human beings, kind of alone and afraid, and we had to prove ourselves to this divinity that was inaccessible. And it was this sort of you know, hunger and search for some kind of connection with mysticism, with, with, with holiness, that led people into you know, hyper-consumerism and the spirit of capitalism. And if we could only, if we could only really understand that God wasn't up there in the sky, in the clouds, but that God was something that we had in our hearts and that we were in fact gods creating and responsible for our own reality that might empower us tremendously and give us another sense of what it, what it is we were all about rather than, you know, filling our property with material, this kind of, um, what was uh, Weber's phrase, conspicuous consumption that has driven the world to this brink. So, um, so the, the, the worms waking by Rooney. So um, I would be, let me just say a few more hopefully provocative things about this history as I've come to see it. And, um, and maybe we'll try to um, invite, if I say something that's particularly um, offensive or interesting and someone wants to make a comment without upsetting the flow, let me just see maybe if that works. Yeah, I, well, I, I can field questions for you if you want. Like we do have one question from the crowd and we can take more and I have one myself. And so however you want to flow it, we can, we can flow it. Okay. Well, let me, let me just go here for a little bit longer here. I want to just say that there's a... There's a story, there's a narrative that's being advanced about the history of the modern history of psychedelic drugs, psilocybin, but all the psychedelic drugs. There's a narrative that's being advanced. And I use that word carefully, a narrative. It's not, it's not just a story, but it's a narrative. It's a story with an intention to get us to think a certain way about something. And I'm realizing, and I've been kind of struggling with this really for about a decade or so, that this narrative, although I once bought it hook, line, and sinker, is actually not really true. Now, the narrative gets its best, most popular, even evangelical uh, expression in the incredibly successful recent best-selling book by Michael Pollan. Now, <clears throat> Michael Pollan's book has sold millions of copies. It is by far the most successful 
and popular book ever written about psychedelic drugs. He got Valentine reviews in nearly all the mainstream media, an incredible <clears throat> publicist. Yes, yes. Did he be, be here now? Does be here now count? I think that Pollan's book, that's a good question. I don't know for sure, but I don't think Be Here Now is ever a, on the New York Times bestseller list for, I mean, you know. Fair, might not have been. You know, Pollan's book was voted uh, book of the year in 2018, right? I mean, Be Here Now, I grant you, was a popular book and we might want to talk about that. But um, no, I think Pollan had a much more extensive um, media uh, engine behind his book. Another one, another question? Oh, well, here's a question from our friends. So so I've got some new friends up in Eugene, Oregon called uh, the Adelic. Do you know Adelic, James from Adelic? No, not yet. Uh, they have, among other things, they have a community-based lending library oh. um, up, up in Eugene, Oregon. And one of the things they would love for you to talk about is the emergence of maps and the history of Rick Doblin's association with the so-called underground MDMA culture that was widespread in California in the 1980s before maps, maps's existence. Okay, let's talk about that later. That's a question that I can speak a lot of. Maybe, maybe the, your friends up in Eugene uh, are aware that Doblin got his first MDMA from my MDMA research project in 1983. And he was the only one of many hundreds who I turned on, including quite a few rather um, well-known celebrities who known for their drug activism who didn't keep the secret. Everybody was asked to, we wanted to keep this under the radar. We wanted to grow a broad base of support in the underground to show MDMA's therapeutic properties before the DEA would, would recognize it and make it illegal. Everybody kept the secret except for Rick Doblin. He not only didn't keep the secret, <laughs> he called the media, he called the government. He called Reagan's drug czar. He called other federal officials to tell them that there was a new, to kind of appoint himself as the spokesperson for this new drug. He pissed all of us off. He expedited the government's action. It was at this point that Doblin really began to be like working in cahoots with the government and an illegitimate system. And I'll, I'll return to that later, if you cool. like. But um, so here's back to this narrative. We're getting, we get this story, okay? And the story of psilocybin and the psychedelic movement, you know, you, you can, there are a lot of places you can, the place I like to pick it, pick the beginning is um, Gordon Wasson's honeymoon stroll. This is something back in 1927. <clears throat> it's a famous story. It's a filmic story that here's this guy on his honeymoon, walking through the meadows of the Catskill Mountains with his wife, and they find some mushrooms growing after a rain. Gordon, who's from Anglo-Saxon background, well, first Valentina, his wife is Russian, and she sees these mushrooms and she says, oh, Gordon, look, they're and she calls them some endearing Russian name. She recognizes them from her childhood as, as delicacies. And she's gonna, she's so excited like a little girl and she runs over to pick them up and, um, and put them in the stew. Gordon, however, doesn't know anything about mushrooms. He has the opposite reactions. Oh God, Tina, no, don't, don't go near, don't touch them. Don't even go near them. They're disgusting, they're poisonous. And they get into a fight about these mushrooms. And she's looking at him like he's crazy. He's look, this is their first, they've been married like 24 hours and they're having their first fight. She ignores him. She cooks the mushrooms, puts them in the stew. He refuses to eat. He's convinced he's gonna wake up a widower. And the next morning when she's alive, he realizes that he's wrong. And this becomes, their little hobby. How come they have such wildly different attitudes towards mushrooms? She loves them, he hates them. They find out this is a cultural thing, that whole countries and, and cultures are divided by whether they love mushrooms or hate them and fear them. 
So really the first discovery in the field of modern psychedelics is mycophobia and mycophilia. And the Wassons devote themselves to this, like, why is this? And she's a pediatrician. He's a very industrious man at that time, a journalist, but then he would become um, an executive for, for the Wall Street Bank, JP Morgan, becomes their hobby. They learn everything about mushrooms. And then eventually, after 20 years later, they find out that there was, there is still a, a sect of Mazatec natives in the highlands of Southern Mexico that use a mushroom to induce trance and for healing. And so the Wassons go down to Mexico and become the first white people to deliberately ingest this mushroom. This is the discovery of uh, Maria Sabina. Now, the official story goes that the Wassons wrote up this expedition in Life Magazine, the most popular periodical in America at the time, also a publication by Henry Luce, a Skull and Bones member and a supporter of Mussolini and Hitler and like one of the most fascist elitists in American history, okay? Close friend of Gordon Wassons. But Luce publishes this article Seeking the Magic Mushroom in May 1957. And this is really the article that kicks off, the, it, you know, the mushrooms had been known by a small handful of anthropologists and historians. And uh, suddenly this sensational article exposes them to uh, modern American culture. And this is what kicks off this thing called the psychedelic movement. Okay, so, <clears throat> A few years later, Timothy Leary um, had been uh, on sabbatical. Uh, he had written what was considered voted the book of the year in American psychology in 1959. He was appointed to become a lecturer at Harvard University and um, and uh, he gets turned on to the psychedelic mushroom by my friend and his friend, Frank Barron. And, and then Tim begins, Tim and Frank Barron begin the Harvard psilocybin project, which they, they invite a whole range of people to come to Harvard from highly uh, recognized intellectuals and scientists and art artists and normal people to um, you know, convicts in the Massachusetts state prison and begin a three-year project to just a kind of naturalistic thing. Here, take this, what does this do? And this project at Harvard uh, kind of got a little, um, a little overly um, enthusiastic and for different reasons. First of all, well, Frank quit the project when it became too outrageous and went back to Berkeley. Tim picked Richard Alpert to be his uh, replacement. And, um, and then Alpert just kind of went a little wild with them and got fired for having sex and using drugs with undergraduate students. And then Tim quit the project and um, went on a campaign to popularize psychedelic drugs. Now, <clears throat> I wanna say this, he didn't just, <clears throat> he wasn't just like Ken Kesey who you know, said, hey, let's just pour this stuff in the punch and see what happens and kind of you know, flaunting the outrageous freakishness of the psychedelic drugs. What Tim did was a little bit different when he hit the streets. He didn't just say, take these drugs. He said, he gave them a different spin. He had a kind of political uh, intention with them. He didn't just say, take these drugs, he said, turn on, tune in, drop out. This little cliche, it was a meme. Tim was a master at memes. He got that meme from McLuhan, but Tim was a master at memes, saying little, little pithy things that had a lot of power. Turn on, tune in, drop out of this world, this artificially constructed, um, socially constructed by your media, by your education institutions and to create your own, let's start a new form of existence. 
He used the power of these drugs to shift the locus of authority from institutions to inside the individual. This was, a, this was a concerted plan of he and Frank Barron. They had recognized that America was becoming a fascist country. These were two of the most promising psychologists, personality and social psychologists in America. Now the, you know, the, the students of American psychology are going to be well aware of how many important research projects in the 1950s were being conducted to show that America was rapidly becoming a fascist country. Experiments like Solomon Ash's very famous conformity study, that 75, 80% of a given population would defy their own senses in order to conform to a group opinion, even if that group opinion was obviously wrong. Or the famous uh, Philip Zimbardo studies at Stanford. There was a movie made about this recently where Stanford students put in a role play situation of being prison guards would actually become prison guards and treat their fellow students violently as if they were actually in a prison. And then the third study I'll mention is also a recent movie, The Experimenter, about the, the research of Stanley Milgram at Yale. Interestingly, studies were done at you know, Harvard, Yale, Swarthmore, the very finest universities in the United States, colleges and universities. Well, Milgram found that 80% of his volunteer students would knowingly administer harmful, near fatal electric shocks to their fellow students just because someone in a position of authority told them. So Leary and Barron and a number of other psychologists in the 50s realized, holy fuck, you know, this is, this is a nightmare. We have to devote our careers to finding something that's going to wake people up to, to like revitalize our own moral sense and not be so pathologically obedient and conform to our leaders. This is very, very important. You know, <clears throat> um, I almost, I thought of maybe titling this talk <clears throat> Psychedelic Movements of the 20th Century, because even though it's one family of drugs, really there are, there are very diverse groups of people that have used these drugs for, for opposite reasons. It's like the history of religion. You look at the whole history of religion, you find there's a lot of wonderful stuff in there. There's ethical systems, there's techniques for attaining glimpses of the supernatural. <clears throat> but to a very large extent, and probably mostly, religion is used as a form of population control, kind of in for, in, instigated by the oligarchs in order to control populations. Marx's famous dictum, religion is an opiate of the masses. This is the case also with psychedelic drugs. We can find the whole history of religion embedded in there. So I'm mentioning this now because the psychedelic movement that Timothy Leary and Frank Barron tried to ignite was a response to a psychedelic movement that had already begun by Wasson and Aldous Huxley as a form of political subversion that there was a movement in the beginning in the 1950s to bring about like a brave new world scenario in the United States, throwing fairy dust in the eyes of the population so they would not recognize the political developments that were being thrust upon them. The 60s looked at in this light was like a period of chemical warfare in the United States with both sides using this, the same drugs but with a different context. So I'm throwing that out there. I've wandered far away from my outline. Um, I have more to say, but I wanna open it up and see if we have anybody. We do have more questions. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on Al Hubbard? And do you have any books to recommend to learn more about him? Well, it's funny you should say that because I have just recently located um, a series of interviews that Al Hubbard gave that had been, um, I saw them years ago 
and I've just located them. So I'm gonna pour into Al Hubbard more. But Al Hubbard was um, also one of these guys who was OSS, CIA, one of the really, one of the major propagators of psychedelic drugs working for, secretly for the CIA. A real enigma and uh, someone we really need to, to look at carefully. What about Arthur Hefter and his mescaline isolation processes that happened in 1897? Okay, well, I don't really know a whole lot about Hefter, but let me just emphasize this again. Like when I'm making these, you know, kind of conspiracy theory comments, <clears throat> I by no means want to indict everybody that's been involved in the scientific exploration of psychedelic drugs. Most of them in the modern era were funded by the government many of them for nefarious reasons. But there's also so much really important, you know, neuropsychiatric research that's being done. And Hefter is just not a guy that I've ever really connected with. So I don't know much about his work other than I, I don't have any reason to cast any aspersions on him. And what are your thoughts about for the future with the kind of monopolistic corporate control of psilocybin and other psychedelics and, you know, all of the players who are involved in in the legal is the, the corporate legalization movement. Well, again, I think we need to look at this all really very carefully. I think it's so exciting what's going on right now because you know you do have this. You have maps, and maps is Rick is Doblin just works for the government. He's a he's a you know a profit seeking sort of guy. Um, you see him funded by Trump's leading you know financial supporter, the Mercer family. You get these other guys, the dr the blood drinking Peter Thiel's, and people trying to control and profit from psilocybin. But you also see these grassroots movements, you know, out of Denver, and we just had here in, um, in uh, Oakland, you know, decriminalizing. To me, again, it has to do with locus of authority and control, that people that are trying to control it for their own well-being, or are we trying to democratize this and let all people have access to it? Have you read the Decriminalized Nature Oakland Resolution? No, actually, I haven't. It's lovely. Yeah. I, I, I do recommend that people, you know, get a chance, look on the Decriminalized Nature website. I think it's probably posted on the Time Integration Facebook page somewhere. It's really gorgeous and, yeah. you know, kind of speaks to our, our better nature when it comes to comes to this. Yes, I get I get that. You know, I, I correspond with some of the people that are involved with that and and also what the the Denver initiative. And I think, see, I think decriminalization is really the best way to go. And we kind of pioneered that in Santa Cruz. You know, legalization is a little bit of a scam that becomes so over-regulated, but decriminalize it kind of keeps the profit motive out and lets people, you know, explore these things with their own kind of sense of safety and responsibility. And that's, um, I think and that's good. And just a little plug, Carlos and Larry will be here Sunday talking about how people can start a decrim movement in their own town. Yeah. I mean, look, we live in a country that is, that is uh, you know, founded on the basis of uh, religious freedom. And then we've got a body of plant substances that are very responsible for the, for the origin of religion. And so we ought to be able to look into these things without institutions or corporations or, or uh, you know, getting permission or buying or selling, you know, it's, it's our free right to privacy. And we ought to affirm these kind of constitutional uh, protections. Right. I was going to, uh, I have to, you didn't give me enough time, Daniel. We got too much stuff here. Like, can we, I share this? Look we'll do this. our, we'll, we can do, we'll, we'll, we'll circle back another time and do more. You know, like, I love this. I was going to get oh. into more about how. So with Leary, I just want to say real quick, People talk about Leary being a Fed all the time. Yeah, well, he wasn't a Fed all the time. He was just a Fed some <laughs> of the time. You know, Tim was, you know, Tim was really just a kid when he was getting into this. And he was, you know, when he and I talked about it, you know, he said, you know, when he was first recruited by the CIA back in the 40s, way before drugs, you know, he said, Robert, you have to understand that back in those days, the CIA was not all bad. We considered it, you know, an honor. We were flattered that the government asked us to come work with them to help defeat the Soviets. A lot of people were completely hoodwinked by this Soviet thing and thought we needed to save the world from nuclear, nuclear disaster. 
But then Tim realized by, I think by the, by like 1963, that he was being used. Um, and this comes about in the all important episode with Mary Pinchot Meyer and the, and the turning on of John Kennedy. And Ken, then Tim, Tim worked against the CIA. And then he was, then he was kind of, you know, up Shit's Creek without a paddle. And he had to like go back to work for the CIA. He was a rogue agent who went in and out of uh, working with the CIA. He's, he's well known and often criticized for having snitched on his friends that helped him escape from prison. Well, you know, I'm telling you that if you look carefully at that prison escape and the Weather Underground, you begin to suspect, strongly suspect that the Weather Underground was, <laughs> was a CIA front. I mean, is it snitching when you snitch on the government that's working secretly to trick American citizens? It becomes a very, very complicated story. So, I mean, so I, I liked that, but we, we, uh, will you tell us why that document was important? Well, I put that document out there. Uh, let me put it out there again. Because Tim is, you know, Tim was a hero. Um, you know, and if you read that document, <clears throat> this was, this was about, so Tim got busted for um, taking responsibility for a, a little bit of pot that his daughter had in her hidden on her person as they tried to cross into Mexico. And Tim took responsibility for it and, and made this plea that he was, that he's, you know, read it because I'm an American citizen. As such, I'm entitled to the free exercise of my religion. I'm entitled to engage in scientific research. I'm entitled to live in my home. And he stood up for these rights. He risked 30 years in prison. He finally won. He didn't win on the religious freedom claim, but he won on a technicality. And this was, there was a period in the mid late 1960s where the federal laws outlawing cannabis were shown to be unconstitutional. Nixon then responds by creating the Controlled Substance Act. Leary was taken out of the picture, but no other medical doctors or anybody who had done any research with these drugs stood up for our American privilege to explore our own consciousness. So I just put this out here because you know, that pollen book really pissed me off. Anybody that's read it knows that, you know, in any, <laughs> any chance he gets, he takes a shit on Timothy Leary. Leary blew it, Leary blew it. Leary didn't blow it. It was all the other guys that blew it, that didn't have the courage that Tim had to stand up for our, for our rights. And um, we're still, we've been living for the last, you know, since 1970 under this Controlled Substance Act, which is a fascist piece of liberation, of, of uh, legislation. It's basically martial law. It gives, it gives the authority to determine a drug's usefulness, either for medicine or religion, to policemen. That's martial law. So I would, I would have discussed that more about this. So... So thank you so much. How can people get in touch with you? Well, um, right oh, now. What, one thing. more thing. Can we slide in one more person? Because there's a question that someone wants to hear your opinion on somebody. Yes. Let me answer yours first. The way to get in touch with okay. me right now is through Facebook. Join me. Join me on Facebook. And, um, you know, sometime, maybe soon, Daniel, one of the reasons that I did this is that you and I are going to get together and I'm going to create my own website with you. And that website is going to have a blog and we're going to continue this conversation and we're going to look critically at, you know, take apart these, these outrageous things that I'm saying. Okay. And, uh, but right now, Facebook. Okay. Last question. Um, well, I would like to invite, um, I'll, I'll put you in the forum. We started a forum so that people could talk to each other and to the speakers. So yeah. maybe, you know, maybe you'll spend a little time in the forum if people want to talk to you there. And on that note, I was wondering if you could send me that document, the Tim Leary document, and I can stick that in the forum too. Sure. I have, you know, for people that want to, you know, have this correspondence with me, I mean, I have I was, um, I was friends with the Wasson family. 
And right. they gave me access to their archives, to Wasson's archives at Harvard. I have a lot of Wasson's archives in my computer. I have got a nice little chunk of Leary's archives. Wow. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd even like to have, uh, you know, some students, uh, graduate students or, or advanced undergraduates who want to, you know, maybe help me sort this out. We're in, we're in the process, like I said, Math Matthias and I writing a book. Awesome. So, uh, so it, our last question is from Arwin, who has been a big help with the summit. He's hosting a watch party in Tulum and he's been he's just been like super supportive this entire time. But he would like to know about your feelings of Terrence McKenna. Well, Terrence and I were friends. I um, I love Terrence. Uh, when I first met him uh, in 1981, I was really blown away by his brilliance and especially blown away by how this was a guy who had a um, beautiful wife, two gorgeous, happy, creative children. He was a guy who could articulate mysteries like no one I'd ever met before, but yet here he was grounded in, you know, gardening and family and really connected. And I just found that so juicy and wonderful about him. I was actually, um, you know, as part of my, um, some lucky things that happened to me, I was um, Terrence McKenna's um, largest financial supporter. I gave him a, a whole handful of cash that helped fund the the transplanting of ayahuasca from South America to Peru. And uh, I thought that was, again, so important. We don't need to rely on Peruvian shamans, like just grow it ourselves and let's commune with the plants. So I love Terrence a great deal. I just think his mind is incredible. But I have to say this too, because when you look at the whole, and Terrence is, again, a kind of an epitome of this. And I don't want to say anything mean about a guy that I really loved. Um, but when you look at the trajectory of his life, from the time that I met him in the early 1980s till the time that he died, there's an arc of his life which is very disappointing to me. He went from a solid, connected family guy, grounded to um, a very ugly, kind of embarrassing, very public divorce. He became kind of a fame-seeking, almost teeny bopper sort of idol. Um, he said a lot of things that weren't true, like Timothy Leary and Frank Barron. We now call those affectionately Irish facts. Um, and so, you know, I see it as a way that it kind of epitomizes a path of psychedelics that is cautionary. You know, when he, in 1981, he was much more of an admirable guy than he was, uh, you know, the way he was propping all these drugs. And another thing, uh, that's a really important question. Um, I would like to call the questioner's attention to Dennis's book about, uh, about his life with Terence called um, The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss or something, where he can points, it points out some of this and it's, De it's Dennis really coming from his heart about his brother who he loved more than anything. But there are some important critical analysis in there that we need to take into stock. For example, Terence didn't take these high doses of mushrooms that he's telling everybody to do. He hadn't take a high dose of psychedelics since the early 1980s. It freaked him the fuck out. And so here he is, you know, becoming famous as a sort of Pied Piper of psychedelia, and he's not even really doing, his, doing it himself. So there's something kind of funny there. Now, I suspect that the questioner was um, wanting me to get at whether or not, as um, some people have suggested, that Terence was an operative for the CIA because of some seeming admissions he made about being recruited. And I don't, um, I'm not going there. I don't, I don't know that to be true. I was probably there when he made those remarks. We hung out a lot during the 80s. Um, you know, we used to talk about that we all felt that we were recruited by the mushroom and called in to work in this field. Um, I'm not endorsing that view, but I think there are reasons to suspect that, that there are deep state operatives in the psychedelic movement that take a very careful kind of investigation. And um, just one more thing about Terrence, because um, this is also comes out of Dennis's book. There's a, an organization called the Summer... Institute of Linguistics. 
that supported their project in Peru that became their book, The Invisible Landscape. And the Summer Institute of Linguistics is a CIA connected thing. So that would, that would require a little investigation, but all I can say about him right now. All right, well, thanks so much for sharing with us. Yeah. Um, thank you to everybody who spent the day with us and I hope to see you tomorrow. Oh, there's a question. How do we get into the forum? Everybody who bought a all access pass got into the is is in the forum. If you bought an all access pa access pass today, you'll be put in tonight. Um, so that's how you'll get in the forum, and you'll get an email. It's circle.tamintegration.com, and you log in, and that's how you get into the forum. Um, it, uh, Robert, it was a pleasure. Um, maybe I'll see you around tomorrow maybe i'll pop in and catch somebody else's talk and maybe i'll see you i hope to see you in the future yeah we have to get together and iron out some of our little things here that came up on facebook a few weeks ago oi or maybe, right. or maybe no. we don't but thank you brother <laughs> i look all forward right, thank to you look, look forward thank you all adios namaste